So there are going to be a few things. Do you have answers to your questions so we can confirm? Uh, yeah, all of the quiz questions have have a question and an answer. And if you guys encounter any questions as you're studying, um, you know, please email me. Um, you you know you can get get my email online or I think I put it in the beginning of the presentations. So so yes, all the answers are there. All right, so bone. We'll talk a little bit about sort of normal bone. Think about ossification, right? You have endochondral and intramembranous ossification, which forms either from a cartilage template or from direct conversion of mesenchyme. And so generally the flat bones of the head and neck um, are intramembranous versus endochondral, which is your long bones. This is one of the reasons why tumors are, are different between the long bones and the head bones. And so there are some overlaps, but a lot of things that are different. And so um, when they are different, we already have talked about them in the head and neck, or we will talk about them here. Um, remember that bone, you know, has sort of a peripheral cortex, a central marrow, all of which is formed by mature lamellar bone with, with nice lines uh, versus immature woven bone with osteoblast rimming um, in things like repair, et cetera. Cartilage can be hyaline, which is quite common in your articular surfaces, elastic, which is in your bendy things, you know, like your ear and your epiglottis, and fibrocartilage, don't forget, which is in your symphyses um, and your, your IV discs, ligaments, et cetera. Um, connective tissue that we see attached to bone, right, com is composed of things like tendon or fascia with regular collagen or ligamentum flavum, which looks yellow in gross appearance, hence flavum. and um, uh, full of elastic. So these purple bands are all elastic fibers. Don't forget about synovium, which is your, you know, scaffold of histiocyte-like cells condensing at the surface with, you know, um, fibrovascular uh, tissue below it. This is not a true lining with a true basement membrane. This is just a condensation of cells at the surface. So just to recall osteoarthritis um, looks grossly as the, um, the cartilage is ebernated, right, or worn away. Uh, histologically, you see this nice transition between articular cartilage that shows cracking to absolute loss or ebernation to subchondral cysts and, and sclerosis. Avascular necrosis, you can sometimes see in the setting of arthritis, but sometimes in, in patients who have undergone steroid use, um, which is this wedge-shaped kind of opaque infarct under the surface, and you essentially dead, you see dead bone with grungy pink material. Um, this leg calperth disease is, is hip avascular necrosis in kids that is uh, essentially at this point thought to be idiopathic, but occurs as this same kind of a wedge-shaped infarct. Rheumatoid arthritis um, is, is proliferation of synovium and, and, and inflammatory cells over the surface um, of the articular joint um, called a panis. Um, you often tend to see rich in lymphocytes and plasma cells um, in rheumatoid arthritis. And in the soft tissue lecture, we'll see peripheral rheumatoid nodules of soft tissue. Um, I just wanna remember fracture callus. Um, if you don't think about it, you won't make the diagnosis, but it is this very characteristic kind of conglomerate of, of, of vascular fibrous tissue, of cellular cartilage, and of woven bone with osteoblast rimming that can be really scary looking and almost mimic a neoplasm because it's so richly cellular. But always ask yourself, you know, if there's osteoblast rimming um, with, with admixed cartilage, think about if the patient may have had, had trauma and think about fracture callus. Um, osteomyelitis in, the, in its acute form can be differentiated by, you know, actual acute infl inflammation with neutrophils. However, there's a lot of reasons why chronic inflammation can happen in, in bone um, adjacent to tumor secondary to radiation or true chronic osteomyelitis with, in, with or without infectious organisms. So er, there is this entity called CRMO, chronic recurrent multifocal osteomyelitis, um, that is uh, in, usually in kids, multiple foci with fibrosis and chronic inflammatory cells that upon multiple, multiple cultures is, is negative. So maybe this is an autoimmune disease, who really knows, uh, but, but just be mindful of this CRMO picture. Um, another non-neoplastic disease we think about is Paget's, um, which is this uh, very um, um, deforming disease with, with high osteoclastic and osteoblastic activity. Um, uh, initially, um, osteoclastic 
right, with, 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 with all of this chewing up of the bone. Then you have a mixed stage where you have combined osteoblastic and osteoclastic. And then end stage is very sclerotic, where you get these um, kind of mosaic pattern deposition lines in your bone, right, because you've had resorption, deposition, resorption, deposition in a haphazard manner. And you see this very abnormal, thick, dense bone with fibrosis. Um, this does put elderly patients with Paget's disease at risk for development of sarcomas, i.e. osteosarcoma. So this is often what triggers that second peak of, of osteosarc in elderly, right? So like in your teens, you get osteosarcomas of long bones. In your 30s, you get osteosarcomas of your jaw bones. And then again, in elderly age, you get osteosarcomas of your long bones related to Paget's. Um, I want to mention a few things you see in the joints. Um, which are crystal deposition um, being gout or pseudo gout. Gout are your needle shaped uric acid crystals, often surrounded by um, histiocytes and giant cells. Pseudo gout are your um, rhomboid shaped crystals, often without your histiocytes and giant cells. Um, alcohol, uh, how can I say this? Gout is dissolved in water. So, formalin is water based. So, if you ever want to have a suspicion for gout clinically, um, try to process these in 100% alcohol without formalin, um, then you will retain the gout crystals better. Otherwise, they sort of drop out of tissue. Pseudogout doesn't have the same problem, so don't really have to worry about it. Um, you know, we tend to see frozens, as you know, in joints for, um, for mechanical failure um, and loosening, which is sometimes due to infection, like true acute septic infection of, of joints. More often, it is due to mechanical failure um, with rubbing of the joint and fragmentation of metal debris into the synovium and, and um, loosening of the joint. So you'll see true neutrophils in infection versus this metal debris in your mechanical failure. Lesions of, of synovium are tenosynovial giant cell tumors. I did want to point out, um, you know, localized type, you know, versus diffuse type. We used to call localized type just giant cell tumor of tendon sheath and diffuse type PVNS. Histologically, they both look as mononuclear cells with, with admixtures of foamy, foamy histiocytes and osteoclast like giant cells and hemosiderin, but they are either a single nodule or they carpet the joint. They're usually located either in small joints for the localized type or in large joints like the knee for the diffuse type. And these can have rearrangements in CSF1 gene. Um, synovial chondromatosis is the other lesion of, of, of joints that um, is multiple lobules of, of hyaline cartilage, um, um, the differential diagnosis of which is osteochondral loose bodies. Um, however, in synovial chondromatosis, we now know that these are often related to rearrangements in FN1 gene. This is a new emerging entity of FN1-related um, neoplasia, so just to keep that in mind. All right, moving into the bone tumors. So, you know, bone tumors can be thought of based on what age do they occur, where in the body are there, where in the bone are they, and then we can help determine whether they are benign or malignant. So if you see a bone tumor on frozen section, you know, caution is your favor. The worst thing you can do is call something that is truly malignant benign, because if you call it benign, they're going to cure it and pack and contaminate. And if it really ends up being malignant, this patient is potentially no longer eligible for limb sparing surgery because they have contaminated the leg and they will require amputation. So if you ever cannot tell whether something is benign or malignant on frozen, err on the side of caution, say, I don't know, it could be malignant, please stop and wait. Okay, so thinking about age, you know, if you're a kid, mostly we're dealing with benign tumors. If you're an adult, mostly we're dealing with malignant tumors. There is this kind of overlap around age 30 um, where you can uh, get um, these tumors that can occur in childhood and in adulthood. So there's these giant cell tumors and these enchondromas, right, that, that can, can span the gap. Otherwise, most of these lesions you're either dealing with in kids or in adults. And I'll leave this here for your review. Again, where is it in the bone? Is it in the epiphysis? outside of the growth plate. It is in the metaphysis, which is the transition between the growth plate and the diaphysis, um, the diaphysis essentially being the shaft. Um, we can think about in kids, there are tumors that occur more predominantly in the epiphysis versus in adults. I'm not gonna go through this. This will be here for your review. Metaphysis in kids versus adults, 
and diaphysis in kids versus adults. Now here we have the whole body, right? Where do these things occur in the body? Use, use this diagram as the most common site for each tumor, but of course they can occur in, in various other places. So we'll go through now differential diagnoses um, with some discussion of, 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 of genetics and location. So cartilaginous tumors that happen at the surface of bone include uh, most commonly this, right? Cauliflower-like stalk with marrow continuity of the underlying bone um, in which measurement of the cartilaginous cap um, is, is what the clinicians want to know. Once that cartilaginous cap becomes really thick and voluminous and proliferative, now we are dealing with, right? Um, uh, on the left, osteochondroma, and on the right, chondrosarcoma arising out of an osteochondroma. Um, most common primary tumor of bones. This happens really only in endochondrally ossified bones um, in which the growth plate is thought to have some aberrancy that creates this stock. Um, remember multiple hereditary exostosis patients have increased risk of sarcoma development off of these. Um, you'll tend to see a nice organized arrangement of fibrous tissue, hyaline cartilage, and then bone. Um, secondary chondrosarcoma tends to grow outward rather than inward. So the, hence that cauliflower-like proliferation um, on the surface is what you start to be worrying about for chondrosarc. So you're kind of, if, if you want to remember anything about all of these bone tumors, I've put a little box right in each of these slides for what the most important kind of things to remember are. Um, BPOP or bizarre par osteoosteochondromatous proliferation um, tends to be these small uh, small digits, occasionally subungual. Um, these are um, proliferations of disorganized hyaline cartilage, bone, and spindle cells that do not retain this nice organization of, a, of an osteochondroma, but are much more disorganized and in the small bones. Um, periosteal chondromas versus periosteal or juxtacortical chondrosarcomas are essentially defined by, do they you know, invade the underlying uh, marrow cavity? So chondromas can, can sort of buttress, right? The, and, and sort of um, saucerize the cortex, right? But not infiltrate. Um, so in a lot of cartilaginous neoplasms, whether they be chondromas on the surface or enchondromas in the marrow, definitionally is do they percolate in an infiltrative manner and surround pre-existing lamellar bone? If not, if they just push, they're benign. Um, and here we now dive into the marrow. So as I was saying, enchondromas of marrow, tend, they can be in the small bones or the longer bones. They can be associated with various syndromes as listed here. Um, they tend to have um, stippled calcifications on x-ray, which is ossification of the periphery of the cartilaginous lobules um, without entrapment or encasement of bone. Both enchondromas and um, chondrosarcomas of marrow can have IDH1, IDH2 mutation. So this is not diagnostic of benign versus malignant, but it is diagnostic of a primary cartilaginous proliferation. As you can see here in this case, this cartilaginous proliferation has grown throughout the bone. It's bowing the surface, it's infiltrating the marrow cavity. So this is now chondrosarcoma. Um, you can see it entraps the pre-existing lamellar bone. It can be of various histologic grade from low to intermediate to high. Um, and it can undergo dedifferentiation, right? So highland and mixoid cartilage with entrapment of bone. Grade can be low, posse cellular, intermediate, moderately cellular, high, hypercellular with nuclear pleomorphism, and then DDIF. So DDIF usually arises as a high-grade spinal cell sarcoma adjacent to a grade one or grade two chondrosarc, mostly because cartilage is hypovascular. Um, these are treated primarily with resection because chemo radio, chemotherapy isn't going to touch these very well because of their poor vascular status. Clear cell chondrosarc tends to be in the epiphysis of long bones of adults with this lobulated proliferation of hyaline cartilage islands and then morphologically clear cells um, uh, and, uh, in adults versus mesenchymal chondrosarc, which is again this biphasic appearance of hyaline cartilage, but with